Hello everyone, Grandpa Ron here again. Hope you're having a great day. Today we're going to get back into our very basic Bible study. We're calling this series A Slice of Truth. We're in Exodus. We're going to look at uh, chapter 22 of Exodus. Remember in the previous couple of chapters, God has delivered these Ten Commandments to the children of Israel through Moses. Uh, the basis of which are all the other laws that uh, are coming. Uh, then he got into some ordinances uh, fleshing out uh, and giving examples of some of the things that might uh, conflict with the Ten Commandments. And uh, chapter 22 is a continuation of that. Uh, these are uh, ordinances that will provide for orderly conduct of the citizens of the children of Israel, that uh, they are godly and upright laws uh, that will teach them how to get along and work together and take care of issues. Remember, uh, Moses was sitting uh, as a, a judge for long hours each day um, as uh, people would bring issues and complaints. So. When you have this many people together, there's going to be uh, issues come up. These ordinances are to help uh, the newly appointed judges, referred to as gods here, actually, because they are representing uh, the Lord himself, to adjudicate cases and uh, decide what's right and wrong and what punishments are uh, appropriate and all that. And uh, these laws reflect, uh, to me, what God considers uh, important for society and for maintenance of our relationship with Him. So let's get into it and see what happens in uh, chapter 22. These first ordinances are concerning theft. Chapter 22, verse 1, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. So the implication here is if he uh, steals it and slaughters it and sells it, he, it was an intentional thing. And uh, he's going to pay uh, dearly for that. He's got to own up to his responsibility. And uh, the reason that the payment for the oxen is more is because the oxen were actually um, a means of the person's livelihood. You know, they were beasts of burden. They worked, they plowed, they did all kinds of things. So it was uh, like stealing a man's tools, you know. Verse 2, if the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. So if somebody breaks into your dwelling at night and he gets killed, you know, you're defending your family. You don't know who it is. You don't know the intent. You can use extreme measures to protect yourself and your family. And that's not considered murder. But if you look at verse 3, it's a little different. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. He shall surely make restitution. If he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Um, if it's in daylight, you can identify the person, I, I guess is kind of the gist of this. The circumstances are a little different. So killing the person may not be reasonable, and, uh, but he's going to be responsible. He's going to be held accountable. And if he can't uh, pay back what he's uh, stolen or what damage he's done, then he's going to be sold as a slave and the implication is that money would be given to the victim. Verse 4, If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. So if he has stolen, remember, this is a society based on, you know, cattle and herding and everything. And uh, if he hasn't uh, killed it and sold it yet, but he's going to pay double. There's also liability in these next verses over... Um, carelessness. Well, let's see what that says. Verse 5, If a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. So people were 
supposed to be um, responsible, act responsibly. And if uh, they let their herd wander over to somebody else's property, whether intentional or not, they're going to have to make restitution for that to the party that was injured. Verse 6, if a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes so that stacked grain or the standing grain of the field itself is consumed, he who started the fire shall surely make restitution. My understanding, it was common practice back then, kind of like it is now, that there are certain kinds of fields that you would burn off. You'd burn the chaff, uh, the uh, whatever's left after the harvest. Uh, so it could be this kind of case where if the fire spreads, you're not watching it uh, conscientiously and the fire spreads and damages uh, some of the good crop or some of the neighbor's property, you were responsible. Again, this uh, concept of being held responsible if you're careless uh, and you're going to pay restitution. Let's go on. Verse 7. If a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him and it's stolen from the man's house, if the thief is caught, he shall pay double. We're going to look at several verses pertaining to this kind of thing, but remember back then there were no banks, no safety deposit boxes. So if you had to go on a business trip, let's say you were a, a merchant and you had to go somewhere, travel away to purchase goods or something like that, you would entrust your money and possessions to someone else and they were to watch over it for you. But if uh, you entrust it to someone and it's stolen from them, then if they catch the thief, he's got to pay double what he stole. But let's go on. There's more elaborate examples here. If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. So the owner says, well, somebody stole it from me. Well, he has a burden of proof, you know, to show that uh, he didn't take it. You know, maybe he took it himself. He says it's stolen, but we didn't catch the thief. So uh, maybe he took it. Verse 9, for every breach of trust, whether it is for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the judges. He whom the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. So there's cases that uh, the judges are going to hear, and it means there's a, an importance for having evidence, for showing evidence. Witnesses would be the best in, in these kinds of issues, but this concept of uh, making your case with evidence is here. Verse 10, if a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep for him, and it dies or is hurt or is driven away while no one is looking, an oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid hands on his neighbor's property, and its owner shall accept it, and he shall not make restitution. So, here we have basically, if you really look at this carefully, it's the concept of innocent until proven guilty. Uh, you give your neighbor something, it disappears or is whatever, and he says, I didn't take it. He's innocent unless there's, uh, if he says he's innocent, you have to take that at face value unless there's some evidence to the contrary. And the contrary would be demonstrated in verse 12. But if it is actually stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn to pieces, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn to pieces. So I loan uh, my sheep or entrust my sheep or cattle to a person. One of them gets uh, destroyed by a predator. The, no restitution is going to be required for that. Verse 14, And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while its owner is not with it, he shall make full restitution. If its owner is with it, he shall not res make restitution. 
if it is hired, it came for its hire. This seems to be the concept of, uh, uh, let's say I, I need some extra help moving a big stump and I want to borrow your big uh, bull ox to pull this stump out. If the owner comes with it and the owner's there with you, the gist of this is the owner has the responsibility of making sure the ox is handled proper and everything. He's right there. He might even be helping. And something happens to the ox, well, there's no responsibility on the part of the person that borrowed it or asked for that help. But let's say he just, uh, the owner doesn't go with the ox. He loans the ox to the person and the owner doesn't go with him and the ox is uh, killed or hurt or injured, then the person that borrowed it would be responsible. I've loaned things to people, you probably have too, they return it and it's damaged, beat up or broken, uh, and they kind of just dismiss it or pretend like they didn't notice. Well, uh, that's not the right approach. If you damage something, you should take responsibility for it, own up to it, uh, because you do have a responsibility in the Lord's eyes. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 16. Um, now we're getting into laws regarding immorality. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and who lies with her, and he lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. The, the male is enticing this young virgin. They have uh, intercourse and uh, basically he's got to pay her dowry and marry her. There is no uh, provision for casual sex or anything like we have today. This was a serious and uh, these young women were to be protected. Not only protected from, uh, and this is not rape, this is a consensual. He's enticed her. And uh, so this is consensual uh, sex here. And uh, But he's got to pay the dowry. And uh, that dowry back then was something that would be used. Uh, well, there were a lot of different ways it could be used, I've read. But one major way was the support of the female. Um, let's say they're married, something happens to the husband or doesn't work out. She would have something uh, to help in her support. If I'm wrong on that, uh, let me know in the comments. But I think that's the major gist of this. Verse 17, if her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. So the parents still have uh, some... Uh, authority here. If the father determines that this guy is not a suitable husband and he absolutely refuses for them to get married, the, uh, the man still has to pay that uh, dowry because the young woman now would might most likely be looked at as what we call today damaged goods and it may be hard for her to provide, to find a husband now. And so this dowry would uh, help in her support in, in that case. Very key issue here. Marriage was holy. Concept of uh, free sex or sex outside of marriage was a no-no. If you uh, did it, uh, marriage was the solution. And today, if you look at our society, uh, a lot of the problems we have in our country are fatherless children, children in uh, single parent homes. Um, uh, you, you can't deny that that's an issue. Um, and what our society has done is say, well, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, that's kind of an excuse to say, well, we all need to chip in. And that's true. That's true. We all should be concerned with the welfare of the children. But the main thing is we should be concerned about the sanctity of marriage. And uh, God's trying to provide for that here. Uh, verse 18, you shall not allow a sorceress to live. This would be like a witch, a, 
again, I would assume the inference is based on the previous verses, there'd have to be some, some proof here. And this is a severe penalty. How often it was used, we don't know. But this clearly demonstrates how serious this was to God. Verse 19, whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Bestiality, severe penalty. This shows how important this is to God. Verse 20, he who sacrifices to any God other than to the Lord alone shall be utterly destroyed. Again, we don't know how often this occurred, but it shows how serious this was to God. This was important. Verse 21, and you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So stranger means someone traveling through, uh, uh, not a member of uh, your tribe or the children of Israel at all, but you are not to uh, mistreat or wrong a stranger, take advantage of them. And uh, if you remember when we were studying uh, about the children of Israel in Egypt, they were well treated for a long time. It wasn't until later that they began to be oppressed. But initially they were treated quite well. Verse 22, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. You're not to take advantage of them. Very important. Verse 23, if you afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. Wow. Very, very serious. You are not to take advantage of widows and orphans. Today, when uh, I get these scam calls and things, a lot of them prey on the elderly, many of whom are widows or widowers, young people that might not have a lot of experience. Just one example of how people prey on the helpless, you know. God takes this seriously. You are not to take advantage of these people. Verse 25, if you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. So within the children of Israel, if uh, someone needs uh, money for a short time, uh, you can loan it, but you're not to charge any interest. Verse 26, if you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets. So let's say uh, someone needs uh, something uh, right away to borrow something or some money just for a short time, and they give you their coat as a pledge, collateral. You're not to let the sun go down without giving that back to them. So this implies a short-term use of a, an item. But again, uh, it's a very sense of fairness and graciousness. Verse 27, for that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him for I am gracious. If you take advantage, if you don't give this coat back, I'm gonna know it and I'm not gonna like it. And it doesn't say what he'll do, but I wouldn't wanna test it. Verse 28, you shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. That's a tough one uh, for us today. We, we have a political divide in the country. God is saying, don't curse the ruler, don't curse me. It doesn't mean we can't disagree doesn't mean that we have to like what's going on. Just don't curse them. Down the road, you'll find out that uh, God has a plan and purpose for things, and we need to trust in that. That doesn't mean we have to obey a ruler's order to do something that's against God's law or against God's will, but we're not to curse them. The Lord Jesus says we need to pray for our enemies, pray for our rulers, uh, as it talks about in the New Testament. That doesn't mean we have to uh, 
pray for their well-being and all that, but pray that they would understand God's will and turn to the Lord, turn to God, do what's righteous in God's eyes, but not curse them. Verse 29, you shall not delay the offerings from your harvest and your vintage. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. In other words, don't delay in your offerings and tithes and uh, what, what should be going to the Lord. Verse 30, you shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. Verse 31, and you shall be holy men to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh torn to pieces in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. In other words, you're to be set apart. You're not to be scavengers like uh, the men of other nations, but trust and rely on me to provide for you. And not only that, but something torn apart by scavengers uh, the blood may not have been properly drained from it, and uh, it may be unwholesome. We'll find that uh, there are no laws that God put forth that weren't for the benefit, uh, ultimately, of the people. So this was an unwholesome thing to do, and God wanted them to be set apart, act differently than the people of other nations acted. Don't act like scavengers. Anyway, we're going to stop there, but you can see these laws clearly reflect, reflect what God considers important. They set limits. Uh, they're gracious in that regard. The rules about uh, capital punishment uh, seem harsh, but again, it's a clear reflection of not only what God considers good and bad, uh, but what is sorely detrimental to society, uh, especially to this society that God wants to be holy and set apart uh, for Him. So I hope this has been meaningful to you, and uh, I hope you'll watch the next one. In the meantime, God bless. See you then. Bye-bye.